Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Melanie Brebner. I'm a subject librarian at the Davis Law Library, um, and this is Stephanie Reid from the Fine Arts Library. Today we are discussing the implementation of information literacy programs at the Davis Law Library and the Fine Arts Library at the University of Auckland. And I'm just thinking this isn't set up for short people because I can't see that screen down there. <laughs> um, there are some similarities between the Fine Arts Library and the Davis Law Library. Both are situated within their faculties and enjoy good relationships um, between the libraries and the faculties. It's good, thank you. However, there are some differences. Today, you'll have to put it up when Stephanie comes back. <laughs> <laughs> Today we are focusing on the implementation of the information literacy programs. The Davis Law Library has been successful at implementing the information literacy program into the curriculum. The Fine Arts Library has had sporadic involvement in the past and it is making progress, but there is further progress to be made. So why has the implementation of law's information literacy program been more successful than at the Fine Arts Library? So this is what our program looks like at the Davis Law Library. There are two compulsory legal research courses within the four-year Bachelor of Laws degree at the University of Auckland. These are taught by the law library manager and the subject librarians. Law 299 is taught in the students' part two year, that is their first year at law school. And Law 399 is one of the um, compulsory papers at stage three or part three level. Law 299, or Legal Research 2, is a compulsory legal research paper. The paper is taught to all students entering part two law in their first semester. It is run in small groups, tutorial style, and there are five tutorial style classes which focus on the legal information structure, case law, legislation, legal and secondary, legal secondary sources, and the last class looks at the research process, ethics and referencing. The emphasis in class is on traditional print tools with knowledge assessed via worksheets, while online modules and tests cover electronic resources. Students are required to attain 80% in this course before they proceed on to Law 399 or Legal Research 2. This is a compulsory 10-point fully graded course. There are three streams run over the two semesters and in total we teach about 330 students each year. Classes are run in a lecture style. However, practical exercises are taught with class sets so that students become familiar with handling legal print resources. One of the worksheets assessments requires students to work in teams to complete a legislative history. But the main assessment is a research trial where students showcase their research skills across three jurisdictions. And this can be tied to one of their legal opinions from another paper. The learning objectives for Law 399 are based on legal research competencies that graduates require for their degrees and also for their future careers. The information presented in Law 399 builds on what they have learnt in Law 299 and extends to New Zealand historical resources and legal resources from other common law jurisdictions. The Davis Law Library is also involved in the postgraduate programme. So all postgraduates who attend um, a, a postgraduate law degree are required to attend a full day compulsory legal research session. Many postgraduates come from overseas countries where they have a civil law system as opposed to our common law system. And others are mature students who may not have been in the academic setting in recent years. This course is targeted to introduce legal research methodology, basic legal resources and how to access online resources. In addition to the academic classes I've just mentioned, we also have targeted legal research classes which are delivered within lecture times as requested by the law faculty academics and also the commercial law department academics. The Davis has a regular program of um, generic instruction that is open to all students to attend. Database training and legal reference classes are run within the Balgali lab that's inside the Davis Law Library. Some classes are taught by outside trainers 
from the main New Zealand legal publishers, and some are taught by the Davis Law Library team. The library first became involved in the teaching of legal research and writing in the Faculty of Law in 2000. This was initiated by the law library manager, but she had a lot of support from the deputy dean of the law faculty. There were several drivers for implementing a course such as this. First, there was a change at the university that meant that some of the full year papers would be taught within a single semester. That meant, um, this meant that the point allocation had to be addressed. Secondly, uh, research skills and other fundamental legal skills had been integrated into the tutorial programme for Part 2 students, and it was felt that research methodology should be reinstated as, as a distinct component. And finally, a computer laboratory had been sponsored by a prominent law firm, the Balgali, uh, Balgali, and this was interpreted as a prompt from the legal sector that students required skills for accessing online information on entering the workforce. In 2000, the library's involvement consisted of teaching two hours on the use of New Zealand print resources, two hours of computer training, and one hour research exercise based on the skills that they'd learnt in their computer training classes, so a total of five hours over a whole semester. The program evolved from year to year. Um, then in 2004 to 2005, there was a curriculum review of the Faculty of Law, and that included input from the students. And it was from there that the legal research program was implemented in 2006. So the content has been reviewed constantly, and we also look at um, updating the technology um, as appropriate, but the basic model of that remains the same. So what made for successful integration? Firstly, legal information is predominantly text-based, and it is also highly structured and that makes it well suited to traditional research methodology. So we had a bit of a head start. But the nature of the research will not single-handedly lead to successful integration. In her thesis, Mary Rose Russell identified active support and cooperation of academic staff as one of the criteria for the implementation of an effective legal research program, in addition to having full academic status within the curriculum. The library became involved in the legal research program with the support and the collaboration of the deputy dean of the time, and that was vital. The legal research program enjoys full academic status within the curriculum. So although Law 299 is a zero-point paper, it is compulsory and it is a prerequisite for Law 399. And students cannot successfully obtain their degree until they have successfully completed Law 399. Mary Rose Russell was the library manager of the Davis Law Library at the time the program was implemented. And she had a law degree, and she wrote her thesis for her Masters of Law on implementing legal research into the curriculum. This increased the acceptance by academic staff of the library's involvement in teaching legal research. The University of Auckland graduate profile includes the capacity to locate information and the ability to access information amongst the attributes that graduates of the university should attain. These skills are not taught elsewhere in the law degree, and students often do not appreciate the value of the skills until they actually enter the workforce. Mary, Rose's, Mary Rose Russell's research indicates that students working as summer clerks thought legal research courses should be made compulsory. And this is reiterated by anecdotal feedback from recent graduates. And it's also been an identified as an area for future research. The legal profession also subtly exerts influence through its recruitment practices. Students with standard commercial law courses are more readily employed than those with more contextual legal courses. Anecdotal evidence suggests that 60% of University Auckland law graduates and 50% of law graduates nationally are thought to be employed as lawyers, although 20% of these do not remain in the profession for longer than three years. However, in comparison to the fine arts graduates, law graduates have a more defined career path, but we need future research to determine if the inclusion of our fully integrated information literacy program actually increases the employment opportunity of law graduates. 
And I'm going to pass you over to Stephanie now, who's going to tell you about the Fine Arts Library. So, meanwhile, over at Fine Arts, um, until recently we had sporadic involvement with the, faculty, with the Fine Arts School, um, despite being situated within the school and having very good relationships with the arts faculty, Fine Arts faculty and students. Um, just after this presentation abstract was accepted, they suddenly increased the um, amount that they wanted us to be involved, which was great for information literacy, but nearly scuttled our presentation. But, um, however, as, as I will explain in subsequent um, slides, we have a lot of hurdles still remaining that we do have to try and scale. Um, so we were nudged towards closer uh, to work, towards working more closely with the library, uh, with the school, with the inf with information literacy implementation. Until then, but what we were doing was offering the traditional one-off orientation for first years, and that was pretty much it in terms of our involvement. This last semester, we've been teaching on year one, two, and three courses, and in their core courses, which has been a real boon for us and um, a huge coup. And indicate they have indicated that they'd like us to do that next year as well. Um, we are also at the moment realigning our information literacy framework to closely follow Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and also the ACRL, this Association of College and Research Libraries, visual information, visual literacy guidelines to try and incorporate visual literacy elements into some of what we're doing. Anecdotal evidence from the um, lecturers suggests that although they are quite savvy visually, they still have, the students still have a lot of difficulty finding and using images um, use in, a, in an in a, a way that um, shows that they're using it with integrity and with knowledge. There's a lot of very poor quality information out there on the internet, and that includes visual information as well. So we are starting to try and incorporate that into some of our um, tutorials. So what challenges do we face? One of the um, other things that I noticed when we started researching for this paper was the fact that I had started out thinking that it was all our failings. What we were doing was entirely our own, our own fault, or the lack of information literacy uh, embedded in the fine arts curriculum was entirely our fault. As I started researching it, I noticed that there was quite a body of research out there on exactly this topic. And we had been laboring away in isolation, not realizing that a whole bunch of other art libraries were experiencing the same problems. So what are some of the difficulties that art libraries everywhere appear to face? Um, the first thing that they come up against, that we come up against, is that art traditionally is seen as a subject that's on the fringes of society. Historically, artists have a history of challenging the status quo upsetting the bourgeoisie and producing work that's designed to shock. When you then, when they find themselves housed inside the university framework, complete with its accompanying governance, administrative and bureaucratic, set, uh, bureaucratic requirements, it sets up a tension between the subversive and shocking artists that they might perceive themselves to be and the compliant employees that they, they do need to be. Um, when talking about the place of the art school within the university, researcher G. James Dyson stated that the tension of being a professional while not being a professional is an odd balance maintained by faculty and university art colleges. This isn't necessarily just confined to art colleges, but it, it, is, it is something that we do experience with them. It, it, history causes it to be a bit more pronounced. Um, the preference, another challenge, is the preference of staff and students, certainly students, for non-textual information and working in a non-textual mode. And anecdotal evidence around the school does back that up as well. But there was a 2002 study by Wolf and Lundberg that suggested that the incidence of dyslexia is higher amongst art students than non-art students. Another one is the movement within art schools towards art education as a professionalised discipline that values the intellectual and philosophical over craft and technical origins. So in other words, they're not being instructed in a technical skill anymore. They're expected to pick those up as they go. They're much more concerned with the philosophical um, and theoretical basis that underpins their art creation. More challenges. 
Um, the nature of the research that they engage in, and this is a real a, a biggie for us, this is huge. Um, Helen Mason and Lynn Robinson did a 2011 survey of the kinds of information seeking behaviour that artists in, engage in, and they concluded that any information or library service seeking to match such a diversity of inspirational information faces tough challenges. So it follows that um, academic staff and students simply don't need the library for some of the research that they're engaged in. Some of the research that our year two students are engaged in currently are from, I'll list some of the following, and this is by no means exhaustive. Um, they're involved in looking at traditional physical journals and books, art magazines, databases and wider internet research, a variety of different archives and special collections, independent film archives, visiting council records offices, visiting physical spaces and photographing them, looking at old advertisements, both film and still, investigating modern, modern consumer perishable products, examining old work contracts for possible exhibition, old tenancy agreements, investigating the use of empty boxes, collecting personal and found ephemera, bus tickets, post-it notes, business cards, ticket stubs, researching blogs and writing one's own blog. In the 2005-2006 US, US National Association of the School of Art and Design's handbook, Jennifer Parker noted that there was a lack of any reference within that handbook to information literacy and suggested that this leaves librarians who work with studio artists, it leaves us with no mandate, no professional mandate on information literacy and that is a mandate that often occurs in other design disciplines. Another challenge that we face is the post-university employment landscape. And as you heard with law, there is a much more proscribed path, career path, that those graduates follow. With uh, fine arts graduates, there's no cohesive community that oversees the education of young artists. There's no employer's representative body which has input into how they're uh, taught or whether they should have information literacy skills. There's no clear career path. There's probably no job for a lot of them at the end of it as well. Um, there's no, it doesn't lead to secure employment and this contrasts with law students. And it's possible that that, and it's probable that that university, post-university landscape impacts their decisions on what kind of skills they're going to concentrate on within the university environment. As another writer in art documentation in 2008, Aniko Halverson said, there are few, if any, existing formulas in place to create information literacy programs that can adequately address the particular and idiosyncratic needs of art students. So with that in mind, where do we go within our library and perhaps other libraries? And before I talk about our possible approaches, I'd like to emphasize that we have no silver bullet and what we're trying might already have been tried in many other libraries. Um, and we, have, we don't purport to be offering revolutionary techniques or cutting edge techniques at all. Um, there are some approaches that we're trying that involve, that acknowledge the need, as noted by Sandra Cowan, to know what they're researching or to understand the nature of art research, and that's probably the biggest thing that we need to do. The, she says the assumption of many people that are writing in the field of what artists do for their research, their assumption is that the library is the primary place where artists do or should seek information. There's also a tacit assumption that there's a correct way to use libraries and a strong thread of belief that artists deviate from this correct usage. And that's the first thing that we have to step away from is being so library centric. So they might be doing research without us recognizing it. We need to broaden our idea of what we think constitutes research and the best way we can do that is to simply talk to them and ask them about their research. And we need to ask them about that research in a way that is not library-centric. I was at an um, at Atlas of New Librarianship webinar um, run by David Lanks, the author of the book, the other day, and he was very concerned about the idea of going up to researchers, uh, faculty, and saying, how can we support you? And he said, no, what you need to do is talk to them about their research, get them to talk, just talk, 
and then you can go away later and figure out whether or not there's a place for you that you could actually help them but stop trying to drag it back to the library all the time. And that's something that we find very challenging that we are trying to work on. So we also need to do a better job of communicating to fine arts staff that, and students that the skills that they learn in database or catalogue searching, and they do need those, they are transferable and that they can actually go and use them in post-university work. Those skills fit into the graduate profile, as Melanie was mentioning, and they are there for a reason. They're there because they do help those graduates go out and take a fuller place in the world, in society, and make their contribution, either for paid work or unpaid work. We also need to maintain our print resources. Um, a lot of their research can be serendipitous, so the, um, the action of sitting there and browsing is an extremely important one. And we also need to recognise that that's not just aimless searching because they can't be bothered looking at the catalogue. That is literally art research and they are possibly going to find something that they, they're not going to find any other way. Continue to build relationships. That's obvious but worth restating and that comes back to our previous point of getting them to getting staff and students to talk about their research. Um, we need to expect and accept the unexpected. Staff and students don't necessarily know where they're going with their research and they don't know how they'll get there, so they can't necessarily explain it to us when they're asking for help. We don't need necessarily the traditional form of the reference interview. What we need and what we've started to try and do is to sit down and just let them talk. And we see that as a start of a conversation which may go on over a period of months possibly years, um, it certainly goes on over a number of weeks depending on what project they're involved in. And then it's followed up by emails, phone calls and so on. So we don't get this nice, neat reframing of the research question which we can then plug in and find the information that they need or help them find the information that they need. It's much messier and there are lots of loose ends and one conversation is not going to fulfil those needs. Uh, we need to place the library resources within the wider context of multiple research destinations rather than seeing the library as having the answer to all their research needs. As Cowan, Sandra Cowan also said, she said, information seeking is a creative process that begins and ends outside the walls of any library. Those of us who work within the library world do not necessarily have a complete understanding of the process for artists. The only way we'll gain that understanding we need in order to be truly user-centred rather than prescriptors, prescriptive is by talking to the artists themselves. We also need to look at what other institutions are doing, and this is a huge thing for us because we've been labouring away in isolation. Other people are encountering these problems as well, so what are they doing? What can we adapt? So in conclusion, there are some similarities. We have the graduate profile, which provides institutional support. We have faculty support, although in our case in fine arts it's much more recent. Uh, within both schools we observe a commitment to developing information literacy skills. However, there are probably more differences than similarities. The nature of research is the biggest one. The wide-ranging nature makes the traditional linear structured information literacy model used by faculties such as law inappropriate for the fine arts school. The students and staff attracted to each discipline have very different learning preferences and research methods. The wider community beyond the university for both disciplines is very different and bring different degrees of pressure to bear on the information literacy program, or in fine arts case, no pressure whatsoever because there's no cohesive body out there. Uh, the post-university careers path is another stark difference between the two the career path of each graduate between law and fine arts is very different. And future research. Um, we'd like to know what happens to fine arts graduates after they leave university. Do they have or need the information literacy skills they need, they, we think they need? Do they think they need them? Uh, what are other higher education institutions doing regarding information literacy embedding in fine arts? And that's a biggie for us as well. Um, and it would also be really interesting to follow fine arts students through their degree regarding information literacy. 
But um, again, that needs to be done in a way that's not library-centric. Uh, a lot of research is done about how we can help them or, or how you know, sort of bolstering our image in the eyes of, of students, and that's not necessarily going to be particularly helpful to the students. And for the conclusion, I will hand over to Mel. If we had to sum up what we learnt in researching this paper into one central idea, it would be that when considering information literacy, one size does not fit all. And this is even more pronounced when considering visual literacy. It is important that librarians understand the nature of research within their faculty or discipline, as well as the different learning preferences that might be evident. An awareness of the research methods that may be peculiar to their discipline is important. These may be idiosyncratic and not sit well within traditional models or even recognised by librarians as research. You may even need to do some convincing within your own library that models that work well for law, education or science may not be viewed as relevant, um, may be viewed as irrele irrelevant by fine arts, mathematics or music students. It is important to think about how we can help students acquire information literacy skills that be can be used in any research situation, either inside or outside of the library. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melanie and Stephanie, for that very um, interesting presentation. And uh, I'm sure all of us that are involved in tertiary uh, libraries really relate to the challenges with the embedding of the information literacy modules. Um, we have, we've got a few minutes for, uh, now for question time. Have we got somebody with a microphone? Lucy? Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paula, um, I'm a school librarian, so I really loved your message about um, finding out what the students are doing. Mm. Can you tell me if you've encountered any staff resistance to that approach mm. and how you've managed it? Um, there is some staff resistance, they don't, some staff, and they are a minority, don't like to talk about their research. Um, and that is one of the things that we need to understand about art research in particular, is that some of it is actually coming from a very personal space, um, and they're perhaps not at a point where they want to share it. And in that case, we simply move on to someone who is willing to talk. We can't convert everyone, and that's not our, our role um, or our goal. We're wanting to make them aware that we are there if they need stuff. Um, but at the moment, because we're, this is in its infancy, really, we are just trying to work on people who are forthcoming, and there are enough of them who will, who will be. 